And I'm Jill Coleman. Welcome to the Best Life Podcast. Here, we talk about everything from success, money, relationships, and entrepreneurship to productivity, honest communication, positive psychology, and how to cultivate an abundance mindset. Make money, travel the world, deepen your relationships, live full out. This is the Best Life. Welcome, it's Danny J. And Jill Coleman. It is episode three of the Best Life Podcast, and we are following up with the last episode, which was heavy and deep, and we uh, had to get a few drinks afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It definitely gave us a little bit of an emotional hangover, but I think it was. It served the purpose of setting the tone for the kinds of conversations that we want to have on this podcast, as well as kind of starting to remove some of the taboo and potentially embarrassing, shameful, scary conversations that you and I both know a lot of people are having with themselves or behind closed doors. And so I wanted to, to, I think we hopefully did a good job of setting the tone and setting the stage for some messy conversations, but also some transformative ones as well. Yeah, some transformative ones. And we got some feedback already. And I think it's great. I think that a lot of people, hopefully, even if you haven't gone through this experience, you can relate to the feelings and the experiences that we had um, just on your own level and, and maybe just to help you in the future. Or you can pass this along to somebody else who may need it. So today we're going to really talk about, since you guys know the groundwork, we're going to talk about the lessons because I think what's really important is we have things that happen to us but we get to decide how we react how we process it and how we create the story going forward in our lives for sure and I think it's important to remember and I love that you said that you can apply it to so many different things I think it has I know for you and I the best life really has to do with being able to control number one your response to a situation and number two the subsequent actions that you decide to take as a result of that whether that's and it's cool because we've already had some people come out of the woodwork and say you know, feel more emboldened to talk about their experience. And a lot of people said that they ended up staying in their relationship and also it's better than ever. And I love that so much. And so I'm definitely not an advocate for divorce or any of that kind of thing necessarily. I think everyone has to kind of do the thing that works best for their situation. But I think that regardless, the emotions are real and working through those is a huge healing process on all sides. And so we're going to speak about our experience and the lessons and kind of more, maybe more prescriptive kind of stuff in this episode. Yeah, I'm, I have written out um, five lessons that I learned, and then we're also going to share some of the tools, some of the books we read, yep. some of the things that helped us get through. And one thing that Jill said is being able to choose, you know, choose your response. And I was talking to her yesterday, said I remember the first time that someone told me that I was able to choose my response. It was actually my mom, and I was about <laughs> eight years old. She was taking a self-esteem course in college. She had just gotten a divorce um, from my dad, and she came home, and she started feeding us all this stuff. She made us say affirmations. And she started telling me if I got mad, she'd go, Danielle, you're choosing to be angry. And I was so mad. I'm like, no, you're making me angry. And, but it really was early on a lesson that I learned. And I actually would throw back in her face later, but realizing that I actually do get to choose how I respond to things. And that's not an easy pill to swallow, but it's something that can be very empowering when you know that you actually get to choose your response. Yeah. So do you want to start, go ahead and start with the lessons since we were already kind of sure starting them off? So, okay. So I guess I'll share some of mine and then you can share your feedback on it and then whatever you have, we'll, we'll go back and forth on this. So the first lesson I learned, and this is going to be funny because one and two are almost exact opposite and maybe even counterintuitive, but the first lesson was it's not about you. And I kind of mentioned this yesterday, a mantra that I had, which was, this isn't about me. It's not about me, but really we all have our own experience. So when it came to the affair, realizing that it wasn't necessarily necessarily about me or anything that I did that caused someone to make the decision that they made. And so it was helpful for me to realize this because you can go down a spiral of really looking for someone to blame. You can blame the other person, you can blame the third party, or you can blame yourself. And a lot of times I think we tend to want to blame ourselves or look for reasons. And so for me, the very first lesson was that it's not about you or it's not about me. But ironically, the second lesson I learned was, but it is about you. (laughs) (laughs) Damn it. (laughs) It's all about, it's all about me. But really what it was about, what was my part and what was my responsibility? Because there are two people in every relationship. And so to just say that it's only on the other person would have been escaping some chance for me to grow and learn about what I could have done different, how I could have shown up in the relationship different. And this isn't to say that I'm to blame, but I am responsible for my part in the relationship. So I remember talking to a woman on 
actually our friend Nardia's pod, uh, Nardia's uh, mastermind, and she said she had a hard time with the blame. And I said, there's a difference between taking blame and taking responsibility. And for me, it was saying, well, what part of me maybe wasn't showing up in a way that I felt safe for my husband to talk to me or that I could have been showing up in the relationship a little bit different, more open. There were a lot of things I could have done. I mean, yeah, I didn't make him do anything that he did. He could have come to me with concerns. He could have come to me with any issues that he had, but and he didn't. But I also did have to ask myself what part of me was maybe unsafe to him or what part of me really wasn't showing up in the best way to the relationship. So. I think it's hard. I think it is hard to when this kind of stuff is fresh to take responsibility because, you know, culturally it, we're positioned as the victim and the person who had an affair is traditionally seen as the, you know, the uh, perpetrator mm-hmm. or, you know, the one. But it's hard because you look at it from all angles and that person has their experience too and it's still valid and I think sometimes giving that person's experience any credence feels like condoning it yeah and so you almost don't even want like you don't even have like you want to say like you don't have a say because look at my experience I was the one this was done to and I think when we think about something like an actual affair or loss or something like that it you know there are there's so many things that lead up to it that do have to do with you whether that's and I know for myself very similarly it was about round communication Mm -hmm. We just didn't know, you know, we fell madly in love and we just didn't know the kinds of conversations to maybe be having earlier. And I take responsibility for the fact that I wasn't able to communicate honestly, which I think is a practice. And then you kind of know like, okay, any other relationship I get into, whether even that's a friendship or with your family members, you want to have those honest conversations. And that takes practice being able to even know how you feel, then being able to even communicate and articulate how you feel and do that in a way that is very detached and very just kind of uh, direct and not taking these personally. So it's like, yes, it doesn't have to do with you because it's not because you're unlovable. It's not because uh, you have some human defect or because you're not good enough or you're not pretty enough, you're not successful enough. And I think it's easy, like you said, to go to those places initially and try to nail down the thing. And I think as women, you and I are very similar in this way. We want to believe that because we already have sensitivity that we're not good enough. That's why we did fitness competitions and that's why we chased magazine covers and all these kind of ego pursuits because on some level we thought if we just did enough if we just had the perfect body if we just had the perfect relationship we just had then we'd be good enough and so of course for me it hits really close to home yeah you know I have all these things and my husband still cheats yeah and so really the lesson is how do you separate and take responsibility but not blame yourself and then also like yes do you blame them they need to be accountable for their actions. There are consequences, but I can also feel empathy at the same time. And I think that's really, really hard to do at the beginning, especially. Totally. I mean, definitely this has been a process. Like the very beginning, you know, you're in so much pain and you do feel like something was done to you. And then you go through that process and... And I I remember thinking early on too that I really believe in the law of attraction. So I kept asking what part of myself attracted this? Like, was there a part of me subconsciously that wanted this to happen? And no, I don't necessarily believe that, but I do believe that there must have been something that I was emitting or there were there just weren't ways that I was showing up. And like you said, that you just don't know what you don't know. And at the time, just not knowing how to have those conversations or realizing that maybe there's feelings that weren't being said. You just have to, yeah, it's just a process. Actually, the third one is kind of what you just said was, my third lesson was everyone has their own story and none of them are the absolute truth. So there's my story and my experience. There's my ex's story and his experience. And then there's the other woman's story and her experience. And to be honest, then there's the fourth story of just like the overhead view of what is happening in the narrator telling the story. <laughs> but what's interesting is that being the victim, so to speak, or being the one having it done to you can feel very justified. It can feel really good to, to be angry and say, well, it, this was done to me, but it doesn't get you anywhere. And that's what I learned really quickly is telling someone, oh, my husband cheated on me or, or, or he, you know, ruined the marriage and made me feel helpless and made me feel like I didn't have a part. And so that's why I really did have to figure out what was my responsibility because if it was something that I was doing, I don't want to attract that and bring that into a future relationship. I don't want to have repeated patterns. And I really do believe that we tend to repeat patterns over and over and over until we figure out what these lessons are. 
And so I just also realized that they all have their own story and not all, not everyone's is the exact truth. We all have that version of what happened. You know, and it's one thing that you said that reminded me of, you know, you want to have tools. And so I think Mm -hmm. you feel a little bit helpless when it's just about your position as the victim. That's the victimizer, if you will. And then that's the way that it is. And it makes you feel like you have no choices or it feels uh, very helpless. And when something like this happens, you share it with certain people and sometimes you miss the mark. Sometimes when you share it with someone, they're very judgmental. They can't understand it. Um, and they might be like an amazing girlfriend or amazing friend who wants to be there for you. But the only tool that they have is to just say that he's an asshole Mm -hmm. or that like, and be in the shit with you, you know, and it feels good for a second to feel just validated. Like, okay, yeah, we both agree that he's an asshole, but where do you go from there? Yeah. You know? And so it's nice because you have that like camaraderie around it. But then for me anyway, I did share it with a few people who that was the only kind of support they could lend me, which I was grateful for, but it wasn't a tool or a book or a strategy or some way to help me like a kick in the ass that I needed to start to feel in my power again, Yeah, you know? So it's nice to be positioned at times as the victim and, you know, it feels good to, to be the one that doesn't have to take any responsibility, but it also gets old really quick. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) And it, yeah, you just, there's not much you can do with it. So, you know, for me, it was like, if I'm going to move forward, even if I was going to move forward in the marriage, I had to learn how to show up different. And I had to learn to look at his perspective. It's funny because you want to know all the answers. You're like, tell me why you did this but but they don't know they don't know and there's really no answer I don't think he could have given me that would have made me feel good anyway Mm -hmm. so it didn't matter what he said if he gave me all the reasons why and he did try to give me reasons why and every single one seemed ridiculous to me so I think sometimes we're looking for those answers in there you have to sit there and go is any answer going to make me feel better right and if not then you're gonna have to do the work on yourself regardless what do you think about people who say, well, like the person, the other person really needs to be held accountable or like they can't be let off the hook, Mm. you know, or you have people who say like, you know, you can maintain your sense of self-righteousness by keeping up your anger about it or keep, or maintaining that level of I'm better than and continuing to feel on put on a pedestal. And, you know, sometimes people are like, well, you know, he needs to be held accountable or he should be. Did you ever feel like a doormat when you let him off the hook or did you feel that way? Yeah. I mean, I definitely felt that he should be, I mean, there, you know, you think about all the things, especially in the, in the, in the middle of it, like you want him to be hurt and I wanted him to like hurt financially and I wanted him to <laughs> hurt all the ways because of the ways that I was hurt. Um, but ultimately, and this will lead me into the number five thing, but ultimately it wasn't hurting him. It's kind of like, you know, we talk about sometimes we're hanging on to it and they've gone on and moved totally. on and forgotten about it. Or they're not like, I'm thinking about him so much, but he has, he's not thinking of me. And for me, that was one of the reasons that I had to let it go because I realized he doesn't give a shit. So right. why am I? giving a shit. (laughs) It's giving away all of my power and energy and me holding that torch to be angry was not actually doing anything to him. And ultimately you can be so angry and you can, you can get revenge and you can do a lot of nasty things, but that will actually never, ever, ever, ever take away the pain that you feel. It just doesn't. It's, it's like, I I don't even know, is it a Gandhi quote or something? They're like saying revenge is when you, you're like holding poison yeah and and expecting the other person to die it's just like it's like that and it just doesn't work it feels like you want it to and like it's kind of when you're lashing out our kids like they hit it's like they're so frustrated they don't know what else to do but hit somebody but ultimately you hurt your own hand by punching a wall (laughs) you know you know So actually, I'll just say what number five is and I'll go back to number four. So number five, I just, my fifth lesson was forgiveness is magic. And I think that ultimately forgiveness was one of the hardest things, but it was also the thing that allowed me to move forward. And I don't feel like it was letting him off the hook, but it was letting me be free of the obsession and the, the, the need to be right. And the need to prove that he did the wrong thing. It was just forgiveness really was for me. It was more of being able to let it go and let me be at peace. And it was not just forgiving him. 
it was forgiving the other woman and it was forgiving myself. It was forgiving myself for wondering what I did wrong. It was forgiving myself for not knowing what I didn't know. It was forgiving her because, you know, there's the anger of the other person. Like she knew he was married and it's really easy to like lash out at that other person. But for me, and and forgiveness is a practice. Um, I would like to say I forgave once and then it went away, but I forgave once and I, then things would come back and trigger it. And then I'd have to do it again and I would have to do it again and I'd be triggered and I'd have to do it again. And I'm sure I'll have to do it again in the future. There's, I'm sure things will come up still with the same scenario and with new people. And I have to be forgiven for things that I've said or thought or done. And so forgiveness was one of the big, big, big lessons. That's what I had for number five on there. And I don't know if you want to speak to anything on that. Okay, so my number four, so I'll go backwards, was my number four lesson. And I, I know this inherently, but it was just really nailed in, was that we don't own or control anyone and nothing is guaranteed. And I remember this, and again, why I talk about repeating patterns and learning lessons over and over. I remember my my mother was really controlling growing up and I couldn't stand it. And I just was like, she can't control me. And I realized she couldn't control me. Then I got pregnant at 15. And I remember when the baby starts kicking and moving, people want to put their hand on your belly and they want to like feel the baby move. I remember people coming to like, make her, make her kick. And I would be like, I can't. And even at that point where the kid is not even born, you have no control. It's another person in your own body, which is so bizarre. But I realized from the very moment that I could feel this child move that I could not control another person, even though they're actually living in my, in my body. <laughs> Doesn't get any closer than that. <laughs> but really, it was we don't we don't control anyone, and nothing is guaranteed. Even marriage. I mean, I guess the only thing that's guaranteed is death. We're all going to die. But other than that, we cannot control anyone or anything, and we can't guarantee anyone or we can't guarantee anything. And so realizing that we're just here for a time, and we are here to learn lessons, and we are here to experience each other. And whether you have a piece of paper or not, or a ring or not, there's no guarantees. And that's hard. I think it's really scary in a way. For me now at this point, it's liberating. But I think when you first realize that, it's so scary that nothing is mm-hmm. guaranteed. It feels very alone, right? Because isn't that the yeah. safety of, the, of marriage? Right. The safety of marriage of like, I have this person. We chose each other. We're going through life together. You know, I'm the one. Yeah. They're my one, you know? And it feels really intimate and cozy and safe and secure. And when that's taken away, it's definitely devastating and it's scary because you go like okay what now <laughs> which brings me to my number one my first lesson yeah. which is you need to have your own thing yep. for me like the idea and also like it's oh, it, to me it's honoring the relationship to have something outside the relationship yeah I can actually uh, be more present more invested uh, more grateful even and not take it for granted if I have some things that are my own and I and I I just didn't. And, and it's hard to preemptively think about that because you love being in love, right? Like being in love is the most amazing feeling. And so you just want to be full steam ahead, like all in, let's do everything together. And you don't want it to be any different. And so one of the things that I wish that we had maybe done earlier was realize that we needed to have separate things separate from the relationship, mm-hmm. friendships that were just mine or friendships that were just his. And it doesn't say anything about Esther Perel talks about this quite a bit, which is how a couple manages their togetherness and their separateness and some people have a lot of overlap and some people have less overlap and I think it's something that the couple needs to negotiate and I wish we had more conversation around that because now I feel 100% in my power uh, independent you know obviously financially independent but also just like emotionally independent so much so that I can actually appreciate the emotional support of another person so much more now yeah because I don't take it for granted and so for someone who's in a really happy relationship I I think how you can start to maybe manifest that stuff now is figure out like maybe have a new hobby or have something where you feel engaged outside of your relationship. It doesn't have to be with another person, but it could be learning a new uh, skill or going back and, and taking a class on something or joining a different gym than your partner just to ha- expose yourself to things that are just yours. And it doesn't make you selfish no. and it doesn't take away from the connection. In fact, I, in my experience, it actually adds to the connection. And I wish we had done more of that. And so, so having something of, of yours that's just yours outside of the relationship, I think, is 
is really important. It's so important. In fact, when you think back about when you first meet somebody, what is enticing and exciting about them is that they have their own things. They you want to know thing. about their, their stuff and what they're doing. And it's so attractive. And now that we're dating, the last couple of guys I've dated, they actually said that they wanted their ex-wives to have had their own things, to do something. And they didn't care if it was big or small. They just wanted them to have their own thing. And that's really, really fascinating. And I think it's important. It's important for you to have for yourself, your own autonomy and to not be defined by the relationship. Yes, the identity piece. But I also think that it also creates um, excitement in the relationship. It does. It creates like a lot of like spontaneity and yeah. adventure and, you know, and lust and stuff like that. And, you know, and Esther Perel's and if you guys, I was going to share this resource, but if you're not familiar with Esther Perel, she has two books that I highly recommend as well as a TED talk, um, a couple TED talks, which if you just go on and Google Esther Perel, that's E-S-T-H-E-R mm-hmm. P-E-R-E-L. And her first book is called Mating in Captivity. And it's about how to um, balance out the two seemingly opposing ideals in a relationship. We like having the security and the safety and the friendship, the like best friendship of the person that we're with, which feels really good and safe. But by definition, sometimes that can make us feel a little bit less lustful or maybe, uh, you know, maybe not as passionate or maybe not as spontaneous and kind of like the mystery is kind of gone. And so how do you balance out the two things that we need or those two big kind of seemingly opposing emotions that we need to to maintain uh, a strong connection? Um, And the second book is called A State of a State of Affairs, which is all about infidelity. And I loved this book because it's so nuanced and it doesn't it's not a proponent for divorce it's not a proponent for lifelong marriages it's very nuanced in that she's very circumspect in all of the different angles if you are fresh out of maybe a betrayal or a situation of infidelity it might not be something that you'll want to read right away because I know for me even just giving credence to the other people who are involved in the situation feels uh, like condoning it and so uh, but she's for me very clinical and just super, super smart woman and yeah. has 30 plus years of couples counseling in New York City and is really awesome. So make sure you guys check out her stuff. And I think identity wise, this is something that you and I can both relate to is feeling as though if I'm not married to this person, who am I? Because mm-hmm. I'm, oh, I'm Jade's wife. Oh, I'm co-founder of Metabolic Effect. Oh, I'm, you know, and it was very much like the we, we, we. So it's hard because you want to have that too. And that there's something so amazing about that. But I think if you start to build something of your own while you're in the marriage it can not only fortify the relationship but if something god forbid ever did happen you don't feel like that's your entire world yes gone yes yeah i think we were lucky in that we did have a little bit of that already yes and even certainly financial and business yeah and even more so important if this kind of thing happens but i think it's so important if if this never happened i think it would have been great you know it just it's super important to have that and yeah i think it makes you more attractive (laughs) It certainly keeps a little bit more mystery. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's sexy, I think. Um, my number two is about honest communication and honesty in general. So I'll give you guys a couple of resources. The first is called Lying by Sam Harris. So it's a small, small book. You could actually probably read it in like an hour or two. And it's a book all about why honesty is like non-negotiable. And at first I was like, ah, there's times where, like when before I read it, I was like, there's times where you should, you know, maybe a white lie is okay or a lie of omission. And after reading this book, he makes it such an amazing argument for why even the most uncomfortable truths even bordering on cruel truths is more important because in a way your word is your integrity. And if you don't have that, then you, and if you're lying to the person that you're with or even lying by omission, and this is a really hard practice, by the way, I still catch myself a lot lying by omission. There's something that is keeping, and it's not like you need to volunteer everything, but if someone asks or your partner asks you a question specifically, it's so hard to do in the moment sometimes because you want to spare their feelings Mm -hmm. or you want to do what you want to do and you know if you tell them the truth you're not going to be able to or you want to sugarcoat it and so if you know honesty even in the most uncomfortable situations is something that i wish i practiced early on or even just had the conversation about honesty because whether or not i mean i think there's a lot of like what ifs what ifs what ifs what if you know when jade started having feelings for someone else he felt comfortable coming to me and sharing that with me i don't think i was i would have been able to receive it by the way. And I don't think that we made space in our relationship for that conversation to happen. 
So I don't blame him for not for not bringing it up because we had never had a conversation about honesty. Yep. Now, the reason why he and I can be so close is because we have had so many honest conversations. I know right now, if I asked him any question, he would tell me the truth as like painful as it would be to maybe share that with me or and I would do the same for him because it's the thing that we feel like if we don't have that that level of communication, then what do we really have? Yep. Or and I don't really fully know him and he doesn't really fully know me. Again, you don't have to like volunteer stuff. Uh, but if someone asks you a question, I think it is important to be as honest as you can in the moment with how you feel. Sometimes you don't know, or sometimes you're in flex, right? You mentioned talking to Nate and asking him why, and he didn't really know why. He told you some stuff off the top of his head yep. that was probably not what it really was, but he he just explained it the best you could in the moment. And so I think it's important to keep pushing yourself through those conversations. I have so many girlfriends who walk on eggshells in their relationship, and that was exactly me. Mm-hmm. For a number of years, I held my tongue and I walked on eggshells because number one, I was scared of his response, right? I was scared of him and we had a history of like, if things did come to a head, like I was sensitive, I would take things personally, he would lash out. Like we had those interactions and it only takes a couple of those interactions to go like, okay, I know how this is gonna go. And I'll just, I distinctly remember a time I was out to dinner with my girlfriend, Jillian, and I was complaining, complaining, complaining about the relationship and she just goes, well, did you tell him that? And I was like, well, no, because I know what he would say. Yep. It's the kiss of death, isn't it? And so even though I do probably, he probably would have responded in the way that I thought he was going to, it wasn't, that wasn't the point. The point mm-hmm. was having the conversation. Yep. The point was putting all your cards on the table. The, po- the point was letting all the chips fall. And that's so scary. But honesty, it's like, r- it's ripping off a Band-Aid. It really is. The first time you share something that's super uncomfortable and you allow for the other person to have that response, whether it's anger or sadness or disappointment. And the, by the way, this isn't just in romantic relationships. This is with parents. This is with yeah. children. This is with siblings. This is with... And so once you allow for that first time you rip off the bandaid, it is going to suck. But then after that, it gets a little bit easier and a little bit easier until, you know, you wake up six months later and this is just like who you are in the world. And this is just how you communicate. And so it's so, so tough, but you can practice with your friends or you can practice with your siblings or, you know, you can practice with your family members at the holidays. You're kind of like, okay, you know, I don't feel that way. And, and and let the chips fall, let the whole experience happen. And it's going to be uncomfortable. Yep. But, and I should Share something um, at Jill Fit, the three S's of honesty. And the first is setting the stage, right? So if you're a little bit worried about how the person is going to receive it, you can actually say that ahead of time. So you can say something like, so I set the stage by saying like, hey, I really want to talk to you about something, but I'm a little bit nervous that it's going to upset you. But I do like want to honor you and I want to give you the benefit of the doubt that I think you can handle it. And I want to just try and be honest. Like, is that okay? So when you say that, it's kind of like a universal icebreaker. The person is already like ready almost to receive it because they know that you're nervous to share it, right? So they're going to be a little bit more amenable. So the first S is setting the stage. The second is speaking your truth. That's it. Super simple. Say the thing, whatever it is as to the best of your ability again, but also potentially qualifying it by saying, you don't have to agree with this, or this is just my truth, or this is how I see it. You can see it differently. I think using those qualifiers makes it feel a little bit less like the universal truth because it's never, you know, the universal truth. The universal truth is like you put your penis in another woman. Like that's the only like actual (laughs) factual thing that we know happened, right? (laughs) Everything else is a story. And so we can choose and pick how we kind of interpret things. So just state your truth and as much honesty as you can to the best of your ability. And it's a practice again. And then the third S is, um, oh, stick it out. So it's stick it out. It's like, okay, like say the thing and then stick it out. And then over time, time you start to accumulate all these experiences of you like enduring and surviving and being okay and then you start to be like okay I can speak my truth more because I got through that one and I got through the other one and I got through these other 10 things and so the honesty and the honest communication if there's one thing that I learned in my relationship moving forward like I'm honest Abe you know with my you know that with my friends with my siblings any romantic partner even someone I'm dating I'm just like hey I'm just so you know like I'm super honest about anything so you can ask me and I will tell you yeah I love that like it's one huge lesson I've learned from you and we talked about this honest communication and I remember we were on a hike and we were talking about it and I said you know I don't really consider myself a liar or that I lie but there's one person that I lie the most to it's my mom and it's not that I even feel like I lie I just don't tell her the truth (laughs) and it's funny because (laughs) it's like does that okay so you're a liar but you know I think this is a way that we justified in our heads we're like I don't lie I just 
don't tell all the things. I spare them from the yes, pain. You've, and that's the thing is I think we think that we're sparing people from hurting them, from getting them upset, but we're really just sparing ourselves from dealing with them getting upset. And there are things that I really started, and I remember you said, well, what would happen if you did tell her? What would happen if you did say these things? And I'm like, ugh. I, and that was like my initial reaction was just cringe. Like, I don't want to have to deal with that. But one of the first things I practiced, as silly as it is, I, I got a tattoo. I'm 36 years old. I got a tattoo and I was scared to tell my mom and she already knows I have tattoos, but I remember going, okay, I'm going to start practicing and just like Jill said, like, just tell her. So I was in Vegas. I went home and she asked where I went. And of course my initial reaction (laughs) is to lie and tell her that I went to see a friend. Like, this is so silly. I'm like, I'm going back to being 12 or something. And I go, oh, I got a tattoo. And so she was like, oh, okay, let me see. And it wasn't that bad. And I, and I ended up getting this, like getting this tattooed over sessions, like four different sessions. And it wasn't until the last one where she kind of got to where I thought she was going to react, where she's like, all right, are you done now? <laughs> but I was only saving myself from that, like the fear of what she was going to say or do, or just the, the critique or the criticism. But also I just allowed her to have that. I mean, if she found out later, I think she would have been more upset that I didn't tell her. And so it's actually in service to the person where we think we're sparing their, their feelings. But if you think about any time that someone's lied to you, aren't we generally more upset that they didn't tell us earlier than the actual thing that they were hiding? At least for me, that's... Well, think about, think about um, an affair. Yeah. It's exactly, it's the exact reason why people don't share. And it's the thing I think that I was most sensitive to, which was being left out of the loop. Yep. Right? I didn't have all the information. My choice to stay or go was taken away from me. Mm-hmm. That's how I saw it. Um, I wasn't included. I didn't have all the information. And one of the things that Jade says that I really love is he says, if I love someone, why would I ever deny them all the information? This is the person I say I love the most in the world. Yep. And I'm not going to give them all the information that they need to make a choice for them. Yep. And that's the best way you can honor someone. Yeah. In a way, the best thing and the, the most selfless thing that you can do for your loved ones, no matter who it is, is give them all the information and allow for them to have their full experience of it. Like your mom, you know, and she was probably and like, you know, she was like a little bit whatever about it, but she ended up being fine. You end up being fine and everything was fine. And now yep. you have an experience and a show of evidence that yep. she can handle it. Totally. And she can. Yeah. And that's cool to, to find out too. Yeah, totally. Um, cool. So honest communication, like that was a huge one for me. The next is, um, we kind of touched upon it a little bit, which is you're always in control of your response. Mm -hmm. And this is so nuanced, but I want to also caveat this by saying you should allow yourself to have the full range of emotions. So I think, especially as a coach and maybe you as a coach too, we immediately want to coach ourselves up on it because we know, right? So we say, so we don't allow ourselves sometimes to like, you know, ball our eyes out or get really angry or like want to throw things around and we don't allow ourselves to go there because we quote know better. So we'll go like, okay, but I know. And then we want to like, you know, and I know for me, I coach myself right up because I was like, okay, but how am I going to teach this? Right. Or how am I going to explain this? Or how am I going to, it's like, I think it's okay to be messy for a good amount of time. And I would argue that when you allow yourself to be in that like messy, all of that, you're going to move through things a lot quicker Yeah. as a result and start healing a lot faster and get to the point where you feel like you can give the other person the benefit of the doubt and you can have empathy for them and get to those more evolved places that you want to get to. But if you, you can't skip steps, no, nope. you can't skip the, like the anger, the frustration. I mean, I, I mean, remember the day I found out like Jade ended up leaving town for a week. Cause I was just like, I can't see you. And I went and like just drank an entire bottle of wine by myself and like, just got super shit face. And I'm like, I'm not proud of that by the way, but it was also like the best I could do in that moment yep. of like extreme sadness, devastation and like coping in that moment, you know? And then it's like, okay, like how can I, who can I talk to about this? How can I, I need to have a good cry. Like you said, like you need to like honor all of those, the range of emotions. And when you do that, you're definitely going to get to the, to the, the the resting place a lot more soon. I'm glad you brought that up. It was actually something I was thinking about today and I forgot to jot it down, but allowing myself to grieve was really, really crucial in the healing process because you really are grieving, whether it's a, a loss of a marriage, a loss of a loved one. I think allowing yourself time to grieve, time to be angry, 
to feel all the feelings is so, so important in healing. You, you really can't skip steps. I mean, I guess you can, but I think they're going to come back around. Like things have a tendency to surface. It's like if you break a bone and you just throw a bandaid on it, well, it's not going to heal. You got to like set it and let it like give it time to heal and ache. And you got to go through that process. So I definitely, uh, even though there were a lot of times where I tried to talk myself through it, I did give myself a lot of time to you were, have those you were like particularly, I think you were a little bit hard on yourself. I think you kind of came to a place where you were able to show yourself compassion, but you were a little bit hard on yourself at first, I thought, as your friend. Yeah, well. I called you out a couple times. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> called me out. Although you missed the first like two weeks before I told you, so. I <laughs> was a mess, people. Hey, it's okay. It was too. Um, and my last lesson, we had some overlap, so I'm just going to go to my third, which is something I learned from Byron Katie's work. So the other resources I want to share with you guys is from uh, Byron Katie. And she has a whole bunch of books that I really love. And she has something called The Work or Inquiry. And it's four questions. And the reason why I love this is because it is very like kind of just systematic. You can apply this system to whether it's a romantic relationship or it's really anyone in your life that you have an issue with, whether it's a parent, a child, a sibling, wherever you're getting triggered, there's a place to investigate. So any negative emotion that you have is a signal to investigate something there. And so as you can imagine, when you're going through something like this, you have a whole lot of <laughs> negative emotions like anger, sadness, disappointment. And those emotions aren't bad, by the way. They're they're not bad. They need to be acknowledged, but it also gives you a signal to start investigating there. And so Byron Katie's work, I would recommend if you're getting started with her stuff. The book is called Loving What Is. And it's exactly what it sounds like. She says um, she's a huge proponent of reality. And when I first read this book, I loved it and I hated it. I hated it because it felt very cold to me. Mm -hmm. It felt very not honoring my pain. Like I had pain that I wanted someone to honor and she was like, I see it, but it's also the universal story, the universal story of pain, hurt, frustration, whatever. And do you want to be miserable or do you want to heal? And that really, it comes down to looking at reality, the reality of the situation. I know you and I had a lot of resentment because we just didn't want to be in this position, mm -hmm. right? I had a lot of resentment. Like if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have to move over here and I had to do have to do all this. And so we can stay mired in things like resentment and um, self-righteousness and hurt. And I did that stuff for a very long time. And then I think at some point you have to ask yourself like, okay, Jill, but it did happen. You don't want, you don't want it to happen. You wish things were different, but the bottom line is it, it did. did. <laughs> And the acceptance of that sometimes feels like a betrayal of yourself yeah. acknowledging that this thing happened and, you know, because at that point you can start healing. It's only through accepting what reality actually is that you can start healing. Yep. And again, sometimes moving forward in the healing process can feel sad. It can feel like you're letting go of your part of you yeah. because you're defined by the anger, the resentment, the hurt. My self-righteousness was probably like my number one one emotion that I felt I felt so done wrong and like I was the right I was uh holy like honestly I felt like I was I was holy I was um you know without fault for a long time and it wasn't until I went to an in-person event at Byron Katie um held here in Los Angeles a couple of years ago where she does like the, the counseling with people in real time on a couch and so we're all just watching and we're filling out these worksheets about the person I did a whole bunch of worksheets on Jade and I'm sitting up there and I'm listening to these people one after the other after the other come up with different scenarios a uh, family member, a friend, a roommate, and it's all the same thing. And I'm watching the person who is obviously in pain, and I, it's so clear to me where their block is, right? It's so clear. I'm watching it. I'm like, but just forgive them. Like, you know, it's, it was so easy looking at to someone see, else's situation yeah, yeah. to see the ways in which they could heal, but they were so upset. And then I just turned it around on myself and I wrote down on my worksheet because they really want you to judge the other person to see the kind of things that you feel towards them. And I was like, Jade is self-righteous and we've had this conversation, so it's fine. But I said, you know, he's self, he's stubborn. He's self-righteous. He's immature, right? All these things. And guess who was being all of those things? <laughs> yeah. I turned it right around and I was like, damn, yeah, I've, I'm being immature. I'm being self-righteous. I'm being stubborn. Look how angry I've been. Yeah. And the only person that was hurting was me. Like you said earlier, and I, I just did a 180, like just in that moment was like, I'm done. I'm just, I'm done with this. I don't want to feel this way anymore. 
and seeing that just like reflected back to me was all I needed. I'm like, he's being all those things, but you know what? I'm being them too. Yeah. And if I don't want to be in this, cause he's fine. If I don't want to be in this misery. And so I think, you know, yes, reality, loving what is, and then being able to accept what happened and not feeling as if doing that is a betrayal of yourself, like moving forward, acknowledging. So I would definitely recommend Byron Katie's work. She does a ton on YouTube for free. If you guys want to watch like some of these conversations that she has and she says there are no new stories. Yep. So even if it's someone else, maybe it's not a romantic relationship, but it's very similar. The emotions are the same. And I really, it was like the number one thing that really helped me. Well, I love that you brought up that book because I had a book as well that was given to me shortly after. And it actually was from a person who didn't even really know the story. It just happened. I happened to be over at their house and see it on the desk and they gave it to me. And it's called The Five Things We Cannot Change and the Happiness We Find by Embracing Them by David Richo or Rico, R-I-C-H-O. I'm not sure how to say it. And it was also one of those ones where I read it and it was so good, but I hated it at the (laughs) same time. I was like, no, but the five things and I'll just summarize was one, everything changes and ends, which I couldn't stand that because I was thinking my marriage was never supposed to end. Two, things don't always go according to plan. Three, life is not always fair. Four, pain is a part of life. That was another one that I hated. And five, people are not loving and loyal all the time. And there's, you know, there's obviously a couple chapters to each part of these, but that was one of the books that really just, it got under my skin but in a good way, ultimately, it was frustrating to read these truths. It was frustrating to think that things weren't how they were, quote unquote, supposed to be. But it was super, super powerful. And yeah, loving what is just it's these are two yeah good books. And we're going to put these all in the show notes. So I have a list here of all the books Jill's mentioned. Esther Perel, Byron Katie, Neil Strauss, uh, Sam Harris, all of these things we'll have in the show notes. Another one uh, for me personally was working with um counselor, I guess I I would call her a relationship coach. Um, a woman named Kelly Adam or Adam with an E at the end. Kelly really helped me realize she talked a lot about the feminine energy and masculine energy and kind of what you were saying earlier as to having your own thing was how to kind of show up in a relationship and how the two energies complement each other. And so I'll link her as well. And maybe just some, some videos on feminine and masculine energy and kind of that was really helpful for me. One of the tools that I used, cause I had to talk to somebody I think yeah. talking to somebody who also wasn't involved, like a third party. So finding a counselor or going somewhere um, to talk to someone. I know you talked about Julius a lot. Yeah. So I was lucky uh, to be referred to um, a friend of mine, Julius Torelli, who's actually doesn't do this for a living, but he's just been mired in Byron Katie's work. Mm-hmm. He did her 10 day course and uh, the co- a course of miracles as well. Um, and he just loves talking about this stuff. And I was lucky enough to have him as a friend. And we talked every week, mm-hmm. like every single weekend for like a year and a half, just like hashing this stuff out and just like really, he just completely challenged my beliefs. Cause I would say, well, that wasn't supposed to happen yeah. or this wasn't the life that I signed up for, or this wasn't, you know, and he really challenged me at one point. I said, is my marriage a joke? Was my marriage door? Am I a doormat? And he was like, it's only a joke if you believe that it is, mm-hmm. you know, cause we have a lot of cultural norms that we think, Oh, if a woman stays, then she is, you know, weak or, and so he really helped me to question all that stuff. Yeah. He was amazing. And one of the things that, you know, I want to just also say about Byron Katie's work is one of the things that she says that I love is the person you live with is your greatest teacher. And I do think that, and I know this is maybe sounds a little woo woo, but I do believe that people are in our life because we have a lesson that we're supposed to get from them. The way that we come together is so unique that in a way I feel like there are soulmates, you know, not like soulmates, like religious, like we're going to stay together forever. or We're meant to be just more like a soulmate that like Jade is a mirror for me and I'm a mirror for him. And by the way, his lessons are completely different yep. than my lessons when it comes to this, even though it's a shared experience. And so I do believe that the person that we live with is going to be our greatest teacher because they know us so well. They're so good at pushing our buttons, right? And like they're, if you've ever been with someone and they say something that just you're like, how did you know the exact thing to say to just piss me off? It's like because you guys, in a way, like energetically chose each other yeah. to show each other those things. So whether that means means you're going to stay together for 50 years and keep continue getting those lessons with each other or like us and be with someone for a decade, get an amazing, like, so just huge lesson. And then in my next relationship, I hope that I get another huge lesson, you know, that's maybe a little bit different that helps me grow as a person. So I feel 
I'm grateful for that. And I do believe that. And I believe that Jade was definitely a person for me. A hundred percent. I'm all about that. I think that just to toot our own horns, I think we did a a good job of learning some of these lessons. And I think too, that they're going to show up again. Totally. You know, they'll show up in another way. Just like I said, we don't control anyone and nothing's guaranteed. I think that I've learned some of these lessons before and I had to learn them again for whatever reason in another way. And we'll just continue. It's just the process of life. And yeah, I think that there's tons and tons of lessons and we're never going to be out of it, but now it's just fun. Now I'm thinking I'll just have a good time with it, even though we'd like to avoid the pain, but without all the pain, we can't really experience all the joy. So as much as a lot of this stuff hurts, it allows us a deeper experience to experience the joy and yeah. like the, the really good shit. I know. Well, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's it, you guys. Thank you so much for being on. Make sure that um, you, I would love for you guys to leave us a review if you like this episode. Make sure you connect us, connect with us on our closed Facebook group. Follow us on Instagram. And anything else you want them to do? And let's shout out Organifi. Thank you for sponsoring us. You guys can go to Organifi.com and use the best life and get 20% off of all their really amazing supplements and cool stuff. And we will see you next time. Awesome. Bye, guys. <laughs>